Amen. Today we're concluding a series we've been studying called No More Pain. Has No More Pain helped anybody in here? Amen. Well, we're going to start in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. It says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Of course, we've been talking about this, as I said, for a number of weeks. We've learned that God's will is that you live pain-free, that you don't have a life where you're constantly dealing with sickness, disease, or pain. We've learned that Jesus already paid the price so that you can be pain-free, that by his stripes you are already healed, you're already cured, your healing is in the past tense. We've learned that God is eager for you to actually experience that, but that for that to happen, you've got to believe it before you see it. And last week, we've learned that we've got to resist the enemy's attack against our bodies. We've learned that Satan is the one that causes you to be sick, that causes you to have pain, that he will on purpose attack you with sickness and disease to harm you and stop you from doing what God has called you to do in your life. We've learned that we shouldn't just yield to that sickness. We shouldn't just give in and just say, well, you know, that runs in my family or it's flu season or whatever other excuse that we can come up with. We should resist it and we should resist it in faith, believing that our words have power, believing that God will back us up. We've learned that our faith is impacted by what we think about. So even if we have already spoken some things by faith or prayed these things by faith and yet still have symptoms in our body, we need to focus on what God has said rather than on what we're feeling. We need to think in line with God's word that we are healed versus thinking about what, uh, what we happen to see or what someone else may say about our health. Indeed, we need to utterly ignore the symptoms that we're dealing with and thank God that we're already healed. And of course, last week we ended by declaring that FX Church is a pain-free church. Anybody still thanking God for that? Amen. We are already healed. We are already pain-free. and We're just going to keep thanking God for that and celebrating all the victories that we're going to have as a result of what God is already doing, already done through Jesus. Today I want to go to Revelation chapter 21, and we're going to begin with verse 2. It reads, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of where? Out of where? Out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I, ha I heard a loud voice from, what's that word again? Heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Notice this. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Notice that John is describing a city called New Jerusalem that's in existence right now, that as we can see in this scripture, is in heaven right now. In this scripture, we see it coming down out of heaven, and this is talking about something that's going to happen in the future. So this city is in heaven right now, and it's under construction right now. Jesus said in John chapter 14 that I go to prepare a place for you. So he was saying, I'm going back to heaven to continue to prepare a place for you. That place was New Jerusalem and your home in New Jerusalem. Notice how God's dream in this, and this is kind of a side thought, is to be with men. And so he's talking about the fact that, you know, when this day comes and New Jerusalem comes down onto the new earth, that he's finally going to be with men and he'll dwell with them and they'll be his people. And then he, he, he talks about what life will be like in New Jerusalem then. There'll be no more tears. No more death, no more sorrow, no more grief because, you know, someone has passed on. And he ends it by saying, no more pain. And I actually think you could really sum up what he's saying by saying there will be no more emotional pain and no more physical pain. So he's talking about being in a, a, a heaven being a place, New Jerusalem being a place where there is no more pain. 
And what would your life be like if in this instance you had no shred of pain in your body? I mean, what would it, what would it be like? I, I was thinking about this, and I thought about the man in Acts chapter 3 who the Bible said was laid by the gate beautiful, and he would beg of uh, people that, come in, that came into the temple, and Peter and John came by him, and he begged them for some alms. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I'll give you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. And the man jumped up, and he was totally healed. And the Bible says he was walking and leaping and praising God. And I, I can imagine that's what a lot of people would do in Detroit. If all of a sudden all of your pain disappeared, all of a sudden you could do things you, you haven't been able to do for years, you'd be walking and leaping and praising God. You'd be laughing and running and shouting. See, it's really the kind of thing we should be doing now because we believe we're already healed. We believe we're already pain-free. So we already should be thanking God and rejoicing by faith. But notice what he's saying here. He's talking about a, a, a place where no one has any pain. Another way of saying that is everything is awesome. Anybody that has a kid in here, you might remember the Lego movie. And it had the, 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 the song that sticks in your head from that movie is everything is awesome. You know, and that's really what, what, what the Bible is showing us here about heaven. Heaven is awesome. Heaven is a place where there is no more pain. Well, pastor, they're talking about the future. What's going to happen when, when, uh, at the end of things? Well, you know, if you look at Matt, uh, Luke chapter 11 or, or Matthew chapter 10 and other places, but let me just start with Luke 11, the, the Lord's prayer, as people call it. We, it's really the apostles' prayer. But Jesus said, told them to pray that your will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. So God's will now is that what we have as Christians on earth match up with what people in heaven have. So that's one of the reasons why God had Jesus go around and preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand and then heal people. And Jesus sent out the 12 and said, tell them the kingdom of heaven has come and then show them. Why? How? By healing them. So heaven heals. The whole point was for the God's will on earth, or God's will in heaven uh, of people being pain-free would be done on earth. What's your point? Well, the point is that in heaven, there is no pain right now. And somebody who's living in New Jerusalem is living pain-free. Heaven is awesome. Well, let's go to Revelation chapter 4. Somebody say, heaven is awesome. Verse 1, it says, Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven, in heaven. And the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here, and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the spirit, and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. So notice that this is John once again. It's a couple of chapters later, and our next series is actually going to be a last day series. We're going to walk through Revelation. So we have a lot of fun with that. But here we see John in the middle of this vision, and he says, I saw a door, an opening in heaven. And we know he's looking up because the next thing he hears is this voice that says, come up here. And where it takes him is into heaven. So we see that heaven is a place. It's a real place. Now you may say, well, I don't know. I, I haven't seen heaven. I, 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 you know, but, but you haven't, probably haven't seen much of Venus either. In fact, you've got more evidence that heaven exists than Venus does. Right? Because, you know, heaven does things here impacts our hearts. In fact, we were just praising, worshiping God. We got a taste of the atmosphere of heaven. But, you know, many, many of us uh, could, would, would honestly say we've never been to uh, Hawaii or Australia, but we know it's a real place. Heaven's a real place. In fact, it's so real that, that you'll find the word heaven uh, or you'll find it mentioned 327 times in the Old Testament and 255 times in the New Testament. 
So almost 600 times in the Bible does God mention this place called heaven. So it's a major thing. It's a major doctrine. It's not something we're only supposed to talk about once every blue moon. It's actually something that the Bible talks about all the time. Jesus talked about all the time. It's, it's a real place. Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2. He says, I was caught up to the third heaven. And that's really an interesting phrase because actually the atmosphere is the first heaven. Outer space is the second heaven. And heaven where God lives is the third heaven. And that's what we're talking about. That's where New Jerusalem is. He says, I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside of my body. But I do know that I was caught up to, notice this word, paradise. So we call it heaven a paradise. You look at that word paradise, it means a park. It refers to an, an Eden. And if you think about when God created planet, Earth, plant, created planet Earth, he created a place we call the Garden of Eden. And it was a place with no pain. Adam and Eve didn't have Claritin. They weren't dealing with allergies. Come on now, they didn't have any sickness. It was a place of complete and total happiness. And what was God doing when he was creating the earth? He was creating a place that would mirror heaven. It was just a place he was creating for men. And so Paul's describing heaven as that place right now, a place of paradise. And he talks about how he heard so many great things when he was there in heaven. And then Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22 says, No, you have come to Mount Zion, talking about heaven, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. You have come to the assembly of God's firstborn. The firstborn actually here is referring to Jesus because we are a part of him, a part of his family, whose names are written in heaven, who have come to God himself, who is a judge over all things. Notice this. You have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who have now been made perfect. So he's talking about when you come to, to God, you're coming to a God who lives in heaven. You're coming to a God who has uh, not only in heaven uh, his angels, but his people. And we're going to get to this in a moment, but, you know, those of, those of us who have loved ones who have passed away in Jesus, they are in this scripture. You could put their name in this scripture. I could put my grandfather in this scripture. I can put my cousin in this scripture. I can put my grandmother. We, we buried an uncle of mine just the other day in this scripture. And another uncle that passed a few weeks ago in this scripture. They're, they're the righteous ones in heaven right now. And let me be honest with you. They're living a whole lot better than we're living. I was having a conversation with uh, uh, I call him Uncle Phil, Pastor Gudo in, in Sacramento, California, and we ended up talking about heaven a little bit, and, and because he was planning to preach on it, I was planning to preach on it, and he sent me some of his, his thoughts, and one of the things that he said in this, and what he sent me was that we are not in the land of the living going to the land of the dying, but we are in the land of dying going to the land of the living. Man, I thought that was good. Because Ephesians 2, 1 tells us that those of us who were on earth without Jesus, we were dead in our sins. This planet is full of the walking dead. And those of us who've chosen to follow Jesus have come to life. But what we're living here, our experience is nothing compared to what our experience will be when we are in heaven among the living, period. Heaven is awesome. Somebody said again, heaven is awesome. In fact, let's take a moment to look at what life like is like in heaven. Let's kind of go on a verbal tour. In fact, let me, let me download some stuff in your spirit. Y'all want to do that for a moment? Let me give you 12 facts about heaven. Number one, God lives there. Jesus, uh, in, excuse me, in Acts chapter 7, uh, God is, is quoted as saying, heaven is my throne and earth my footstool. He said, I sit down in heaven, I put my foot on earth. You remember the Lord's Prayer that we just finished talking about. He said, you know, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he talks about, and that prayer, of course, starts with this statement, my Father who art in heaven, right? Okay, number two, it's a paradise. We just finished talking about that. 
The Bible talks about in Revelation 22, or excuse me, Revelation 2, a tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. Number three, you know and are known there. Someone asked me the other day, I don't remember who it is, but they, they talked about, hey, when we get to heaven, are we going to remember ourselves, remember, know who we are and know other people? And, and uh, the Bible talks about Luke chapter 16, a, a case where two individuals passed away, and in one of those individuals' cases, they went down into hell. The other individual was carried by the angels, and that's what happens when we pass away. We're carried by the angels. And he was carried by the angels into a place called Abraham's bosom. That was kind of a holding place for the righteous until Jesus died and rose again and opened the door for them to actually go to heaven. Okay, and, and so the one who was in Abraham's bosom was a, a man who was called Lazarus. He had been poor on earth, but now he was with the righteous. And the other man was a wicked rich man. And the Bible says that while he was in hell and being tormented, he could see Lazarus over in Abraham's bosom and he asked Abraham to get Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and put it on his tongue. So what's interesting is that even though he was in hell, he was in the afterlife, he still recognized and knew Lazarus. And when you get to heaven, you're still going to recognize and know me because I plan to be there. And I'm going to recognize and know you. And that's how it is for those we, that are there right now. That's why when you get to heaven and you see your loved ones, you're going to see them and they're going to see you and it's going to be a family reunion because they know you and you know them. God did not do a men in black and just wipe up our memory. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. No, we are known and we will be known. We know and we will be known. Number four, there are homes in heaven. Jesus said, in my Father's house there are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. Number five, there is a city in heaven. We've already seen that. Multiple scriptures. It's called New Jerusalem. Who knew that the letters NJ would be the most beautiful city in the world? New Jersey? Not necessarily, but New Jerusalem? Yes. <laughs> Number six, there is society in heaven. Of course, the Bible talks about the nation of those who are saved. We just finished reading about the righteous ones there. Number seven, there is food in heaven. Somebody say Hallelujah. Oh, you foodies in here, you're going to be all right. The Bible talks about angels' food. It talks about the 12 fruits on the tree of life in heaven. Number eight, there is transportation in heaven. We read about chariots of, of fire in the Scripture, for example. Other entities, or other uh, 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 modes of transportation that move at the speed of light. And Ezekiel. Number nine, there is joy in heaven. In His presence there is fullness of what? There is fullness of joy. The Bible teaches us heaven, New Jerusalem will be a place of happiness. And it also says that there is joy in heaven right now whenever one person makes a decision to follow Jesus. So we're going to cause heaven to have a party today. Come on, anybody believe it with me about that? Number 10, God's will is done in heaven. Of course, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And one of the things the Bible says about heaven is there is no more curse there once again, no sickness, no disease, no poverty, no death, because none of those things are God's will. Number 11, there are rewards in heaven. The Bible teaches about how, you know, it would be said to those who have been faithful, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that we will be rewarded according to our good deeds. 2 Timothy chapter 4 talks about us receiving a crown of righteousness. So we're going to be rewarded in heaven. We'll talk about that maybe a little bit more in a moment. And then number 12, the throne room is the main attraction. You will have a very nice mansion there. We will run up and down, you know, the parks of heaven. We're going to swim in the most beautiful water we've ever seen. We'll have fun with our friends and family. But the place everybody wants to go to, the place that everybody wants to stay at, is the place where God is actually sitting. It's the throne room where you'll see the four and twenty elders, where you'll see the four praise and worship leaders called the beats, where people will shout and praise God and they'll worship before the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the throne room of heaven. And that's why I said what I said earlier. When we come to God in praise and worship, one reason why you need to be at church on time, because when we come to praise, 
praise God during praise and worship. When we lift up his name, he comes down in this place. We get a taste of the atmosphere of heaven whenever the glory of God shows up. And I don't know about you, but in this dark world, sometimes I need a taste of heaven. Uh, is anybody else here? Could you say the same thing? Sometimes I'm fighting off these thoughts and I'm fighting off these emotions and I'm fighting off this sickness trying to come on my body and I need to go visit heaven for a little while and let heaven be rubbed all over me and help me to fight off those thoughts and get healed of that sickness and have joy bur bubble up on the inside of me so I can go forward and be a soldier of God again. We get a taste of heaven anytime we want to because God inhabits the praises of his people. Come on, somebody say it again. Heaven is awesome. So now 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. Huh. Notice that God wants you to know this. In fact, the, the King James Version says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. You need to know this. It's important for you to know this about your loved ones that have passed away in Jesus. Because they're not dead, they're really asleep. Notice that word there. He talks about the fact that the believers who have died, but if you look at the King James Version, he talks about a couple of times that they're asleep. They're sleeping, Jesus. And really what, what he's telling you is that their bodies are asleep. Their bodies have gone into hibernation while their spirits are in heaven. In fact, if you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7, it says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. He's describing what happens when somebody passes away. The dust returns to the earth when you bury that body, and the Spirit returns to God. So that body is there, but it, it, it's asleep. And, and if we were to keep reading in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we know that when Jesus returns, that body will be raised up. It will meet with that spirit, and the body will be changed. The Bible talks about us being able to put on a heavenly body. And, and so we know that really it's, it's almost on reserve. It's just waiting for the day that Jesus returns. But in the meantime, recognize your loved ones are, are, are not gone forever. That's why he says, I want you to know this because I don't want you to grieve like people who have no hope. People who don't know God, don't believe in Jesus. And when, they, when they lose a loved one, they believe this is it. This separation is forever. And so they grieve like it. But he's saying, you shouldn't grieve like that. There is hope for you. You will see them again. Keep reading. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. If God is bringing them back with him, that means they must be with him. Right? And that's where they are. They are with him. And so God doesn't want you sorrowing like your separation from them is eternal. Because it's not. The day is coming where Jesus will return. The day is coming where the trumpet will sound. The day is coming where we'll be caught up in the air and we'll be like Superman. We'll be excited, man, because we're all going to be together and you will see. You're actually not going to see your loved one when you get to heaven. If you make it to the rapture, you're going to see your loved one, first of all, in the clouds. You'll be going up. They'll be coming down. You know, you'll almost be like, hey, as they reunite with their bodies and your body has changed, that's what he's saying. I don't want you sorrowing like people that don't know this. I want you to recognize that they are with me and you will see them again. You will see them again. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6 says, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. 
Well, wait, wait, wait. So if I'm absent, I'm present. There's not some long break between when I die and when I get to heaven. It's, it's, it's almost instantaneous. Absent, present. One minute I was in the hospital room, next minute I was in the throne room. Woo! And so that's really what he's saying here about our loved ones. They, they, may, they may have been absent from, the, they're absent from the body, but they're present with the Lord right now. Once again, I was, as I mentioned, I was talking to uh, Pastor Godot, and, and he, he's talking about his, his mother when she passed, and he said how he was telling people that I lost my mother, I lost my mother. And he said God actually said to him, how can you lose something when you know where it is? And the same thing is true for us. We know exactly where they are, and, and, and where they are is so much better. Philippians chapter 1, Paul said, For me to live is Christ, and to die is what? Oh, man, that's not how we look at it today. People are terrified of dying. I mean, the whole COVID uh, ban pandemic, the whole, all that's happened the last two years have only illustrated how terrified people are of dying. Terrified. You know, to this day, you know, some people, if they could, they walk out in a hazmat suit. They are so afraid of, of, of their lives ending, but believers don't have to be that way. We recognize this is as bad as it's going to get for me. Oh, you didn't hear what I just said. I said, this is as bad as it's going to get for me. Going to heaven's better. You know, Jesse Duplantis was, uh, and Bishop was talking the other day, he's preaching, and, and he was talking about uh, how Jesse was on a plane with my mother. They were flying from here in Detroit to, I believe, the church we had in Atlanta at the time, and, and, on, and or on a, on a private jet, and the jet started having problems. I believe one of the engines blew out. So, of course, you know, this is, this is an emergency. And there was another person on the plane besides my mother and Jesse Duplantis, and, and they began to panic. They were, oh my gosh, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die. And Jesse said to him, relax, brother. The worst that could happen is we go to heaven. I mean, did that sound like Jesse to you? That sounds like Jesse. You know, but he's right. That's like the worst thing that could happen is that you go to heaven. That's what Paul said. He's at the end of his life, and he's saying, man, I, he actually goes in to say, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do right now. In verse 23, he says, but if I live on in the flesh, this would mean fruit for my labor. That's more reward, more impact for God. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. Notice he's choosing whether he's going to stay or not. There comes a point in life at the end where people have a choice. He says, I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire and to be with Christ, get this, which is what? Far better. Your loved ones are in a far better place, experiencing a far better life. Because heaven is awesome, and there's no more pain for them. But, you know, I know that some of us, we, we love God. We believe in healing. We believe in the power of prayer. And we really did everything we could to keep them here. And so sometimes for believers, particularly those of us who believe in faith, someone dying feels like a failure it almost can send us into a crisis of faith. Does what is what I believe really true? And God's not a God who will just leave you hanging. When you have questions, the Bible says, for example, in James chapter 1, ask of God, he'll give you answers freely. Ask in faith. So I believe God is leading me to just address this issue really quickly. Why, had, why did some of our loved ones not get healed? What could be the reasons? And you know, as you listen to this, you know, one or two of these might fit right in. Number one, lack of faith. Now, the Bible teaches that, it, you know, if you believe all things are possible to you that do what? That do what? Believe. believe. Mark chapter 5 talks about the woman with the issue of blood. He said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. For most people, particularly believers, they have to get healed on their faith. 
Now, we just did a series, and we talked about gifts of healing, and, and we know that sometimes he can, can, people can be healed through the faith of the minister, and we know that sometimes God uses the minister as a mediator to help people release their faith. And, 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 but many times, people have to get healed based on their own faith. And a lot of times what people do is they don't really put the time in to build their faith before the sickness hits them. So then they're trying to build their faith right in the middle of their trial, and that is hard to do. It is hard to build a ship in the middle of a storm. It's one reason why we did this healing series right now. Some of you might have been listening to this series and saying, actually, I'm feeling pretty good. I don't know. I wish Pastor would hurry on and preach about something else. I'm still helping you. I'm helping you build your faith so that when Satan tries to attack you, you have the faith necessary to resist him and walk in health. But sometimes, and I know it sounds like, you know, we don't like to talk about it. You know, we, we feel like we're criticizing somebody. No, we're not criticizing because it's tough. It's the fight of faith. Sometimes people just weren't able to walk by faith like they needed to in that moment. Number two, lack of prayer. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll mention James chapter 5, first of all. It says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. Now, the, the, the Bible goes on to say there, the, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So when the Bible says pray for one another in that context, that you may be healed, it's not talking about me throwing up a quick prayer. It's talking about me supplicating in prayer, making this my prayer project. Paul said, strive together with, for me in prayer. He talked about Epaphras who labored fervently for you in prayer. It's talking about giving birth to someone else's healing through prayer. I'm sure with you before how Kenneth Hagin was talking about a church he went to and how the pastor was able to share that that church had had no one die prematurely for something like 20-something years. And he asked them, well, what, 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 what happened? How was that so? And he said, anytime anyone in the church gets really sick and the church finds out, they immediately book out all the prayer rooms and they just begin to pray for that person. And he says, the longest they ever took was three days for somebody to be healed. And so what happened was the church took responsibility for each other's health. And, you know, Paul talked about being delivered from prison through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit in Christ Jesus. Your prayers release, releases power that helps me get out. In fact, that's what happened to Peter in Acts chapter 12. He was in prison. They were going to kill him the next morning, but the church was praying in a small group, and an angel showed up and got him out. Part of the problem we have as a body of Christ is that most of us don't actually have a prayer life. I just preached on this on first Wednesday. If you missed it, listen to the message. We're going to come back to it. Most Christians don't actually pray very much. We don't supplicate. We don't strive in prayer. We don't give birth to people's blessings. The only time we ever really strive in prayer is if we're in trouble. When the Bible says in Ephesians 6 that you need to pray always and watch thereunto on behalf of other saints. Stay spiritually aware for when they might need you to jump in and pray for them. So sometimes what happens is people are in need of help, and because we don't spend enough time in prayer, we're not even spiritually alert enough, or we don't care enough to go to bat for them, they pass away. Now, I don't say that for you to get offended or mad at your church, or no, no, I'm just explaining some of the things that happens that causes people to pass away uh, that, that maybe we, we know we're, we're believers, it's, it's quiet in this church, but we're giving some answers. Number three, seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. What is that? That's the law of the world. Everything works by seed time and harvest, right? The food we eat, most of it, at least what we should be eating. I can't say that I always eat what I'm supposed to be eating, but what, how do we get it? You sow a seed, you give it time, you get a harvest. You are a result of seed time and harvest. Do I have to explain that? No. 
Everything in this world is real seed time harvest. And so every action we take is a seed that produces a harvest. And if you take 20, 30 years and you smoke all those years, you're going to have a harvest at the end of your life. You're eating chitlins and pork and all this stuff you know ain't, you ain't supposed to eat for 45, 50, clogging up your arteries, doing all. You're going to have a harvest at the end of your life. And sometimes the seeds we sow are seeds of disobedience. You, you just know you're wrong, and you keep living wrong. And, and after a while, you know, it's not that God doesn't love you. It's not that God hasn't given you space to repent. It's that you just chose not to. So even though at the end of your life you decide to get right before God and God's happy to have you in the family, you've done so much damage to your body that you check out of this place early. And once again, I'm just giving different possibilities. I'm not talking about your love, and don't get mad at me, don't get offended, don't send me no emails or DM, don't DM me on Instagram and make me block you, pull out my block ministry, come on now, don't, don't do that. I'm just talking about some reasons why loved ones sometimes didn't get healed. Number four, and this is really important, we're not promised to live in this body forever. Now, there are scripture that points to us having the right to live here for 120 years. But the scripture does not say you will not die. The only thing that will keep someone from dying is if Jesus returns first. But if he did not return in the next 75 years, I would pass on happily because heaven is awesome. And the same thing is true for everybody in this room. At some, sometimes someone has lived out their life. You know, Psalm 91 talks about, you know, you get into a place where you're, you're satisfied. With long life, will I satisfy? Sometimes people get to 90, 95, and, and they, they got a choice, and they say, you know what? I've done everything I want to do. I've seen my kids, my kids' kids, my kids' kids' kids. I've done this, that, and the other, and hey, I'm ready to go to heaven. This place stinks anyway. And that's okay. And you can't believe over somebody's will. God does not allow your faith to override somebody else's will. God won't override free will. Come on, ain't anybody glad about that? Aren't you glad somebody couldn't believe and receive you into, your, into their life? Lord, they fine. I want to believe and receive them into being my husband. I don't know about you. I'm glad nobody believed and received me into being their husband. And you can't believe and receive somebody to stay here on earth when they are ready to go. Revelation 14, 13 says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this down. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. We know enough from what we've already seen that it doesn't just apply to people from that point on. Yes, says the Spirit, they are blessed indeed for they will rest from their hard work. Look at that. Heaven is a place of rest refreshing. You know, when we do get past all of this, you get past what's happening in the world, Jesus returns, and, and, and you know, you have uh, the tribulation, and then Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom, and he reigns for a thousand years. We actually have work to do. You're not going to sit around for eternity on a cloud playing a harp. I don't know about you, I wouldn't even want to do that. I look at this universe that God has created that's expanding at the rate of 186,000 miles per second. And I can't wait to check out these planets because that's how I'm wired. I like outer space and science fiction. And so I'm like, ooh, can I see that one? Can we go to this one? What's that star called? We got stuff to do. God's got ages to come for us. And there are things we'll be doing for him. But during this time, those who are in heaven are just resting. They're refreshing. And notice this, their good deeds follow them. Indeed, we saw this in Matthew 25, 21. I mentioned it to you earlier. His Lord said to him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the, notice what he calls heaven, the joy of your Lord. You've heard the statement, only what you do for God will last. Anybody ever heard that statement? And it's true. Everything you do for God, heaven is paying attention to. There is a list in heaven. You're racking up points just like you're playing a video game. 
And when you get to heaven, you get to cash in. You're going to be rest. You're going to rest, and you're going to be rewarded. Hebrews 12, 1 says something else, too, about our loved ones. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, I love how the message translation says, all these veterans cheering us on. Let us lay aside every weight and ascent which so easily snares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So actually, they're not just enjoying themselves, having a good time, talking to each other, even worshiping God. They're actually watching us right now. Earth is the ultimate reality show. The Bible says we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. The best example of this would be a football stadium or a track and field stadium. Many of us watch the Olympics, so we've seen those huge stadiums, and everybody is in, is in the stands looking at what's on the field. Our, our loved ones are in the stands, and we're on the field. And Paul is saying, let's run our race well. They're watching us. They're cheering us on. That's what's happening. In fact, I, sometimes I'll watch the NBA All-Star Game, and one of the things that, that I've always noticed is that, you know, when they have the All-Star Game and they have all these stars on the court, that often they have even bigger stars on the, on the floor in the front row. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the legends. I'm talking about the Bill, uh, why, why I want to say Bill Walsh, Bill Russell, excuse me and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's, and the Magic Johnson's, and, and the, even the Michael Jordan's, and the Isaiah Thomas's, and they have them all around. And, and they're not on the court because they can't play anymore. But they're still sitting there watching the game, and they also are constantly being honored for the kind of player they were. And that's our loved ones right now. They're not on the court anymore. They're in the front row. They're being honored for all that they did while they're cheering us on, saying, come on, come on you can do it. You can, you can do this for God. You can get that reward. So your loved ones are resting. They're enjoying their rewards. They're full of joy. And they're watching us right now. Somebody say, heaven is awesome. So what about us? Philippians chapter 3. Verse 20 reads, but we are citizens of heaven. Where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. No, he didn't say we will be citizens. He said we who have chosen to follow Jesus, that's who he's talking to when he wrote this letter, are citizens of heaven. Right now, you are a citizen of heaven. No, I'm a United States citizen. Well, maybe naturally, but there's a higher law here. Spiritually, you are a citizen of heaven. You are a full citizen of heaven with all the rights and privileges of heaven. I mean, we, some of the stuff we preach to you, we talk about healing, we talk about, you know, authority, and we talk about prosperity, and we talk about being, you know, preaching with power. We could really call all of those the heaven's bill of rights. As a citizen of heaven, you have a right to health. You have a right to wealth, no matter what anybody says. The Bible's clear on it. You have a right to use your authority to stump on Satan every single day of your life. You have a right to peace. You've got a right to the anointing of God, to being used by God. I mean, there's so many things you have a right to today. It's the only reason why we, know we, why we preach these things. People want to call it a prosperity gospel because they don't know the gospel. They haven't actually read the Bible with their eyes open because the Bible, the gospel, is, is a gospel that Jesus preached all the way in the book of Matthew and Mark when he said the kingdom of God is at hand, and he talked about finding your place into the kingdom. He said the, the violent take it by force. 
He wasn't talking about you getting to the kingdom when you got to heaven. He's talking about the fact that the kingdom is here on earth. You can join the kingdom right now. You do it when you choose to accept him as your king. And because you're a citizen of the kingdom of God, you don't have to be sick no more. You don't have to be poor no more. You don't have to be depressed no more. Your family doesn't have to be broken up anymore. You don't have to be find, trying to figure out what your life's about anymore. You don't have to give in to whatever Satan's trying to do. You're a son of God, a daughter of God. Healing is yours. Wealth is yours. Authority is yours. The anointing is yours. You can walk like a soldier of God in this earth and help him reach millions. You're a citizen of heaven now. And that might help some of us to stop acting like we're a citizen of hell. Stop living like you're one of them when you're not. You belong to him. No, man, you're a citizen right now. This is not our home. Heaven is. I know we're proud of Detroit. We're in Detroit for Detroit. We should be proud of where we live. We should be even more proud of New Jerusalem. That's really where we live. One day we're going to be in New Jerusalem, but we're supposed to be for New Jerusalem right now trying to get as many people as possible to join up with the family of God so that will be their home too. Jesus said we are in the world, but not of the world. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, we, at that moment that we chose to follow Jesus, we were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We switched citizenships because the one thing about this world is that you are a citizen of one or two one of two places you're either a citizen of hell or a citizen of heaven and this whole thing what we're doing today what, what's happening in churches all across the world today what believers should be doing from monday to saturday and sharing Jesus and, and, and being the best in their arenas of life so that they can have a platform to help people see the truth about Jesus. It's all about getting people to switch citizenships. Because the kingdom of hell requires you to be a part of it. You don't have a choice. When you're born in the planet, you're born as a citizen of hell. But Jesus came so that you have the right to go into the citizen of heaven. At any point, you can choose a different president. At any point, you can say, you know what? I don't want to serve the enemy anymore. I want to follow Jesus. The door of heaven is open to you. You can be a citizen of heaven anytime you want. Hebrews 11 verse 13 says, all these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. Notice this, talking about those Old Testament saints, those faith champions in Hebrews 11. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. The King James Version says a pilgrim. What does that mean? I'm just passing through. Somebody say, I'm just passing through. Goes on to say, obviously people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. The King James Version says they are seeking, they're craving after a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back, the Bible says. But they were looking, and the word long fits here, they, they desired, they were longing for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Notice how these people lived. They didn't live focused on this world. They lived focused on that world. They didn't live getting so caught up in the things of this world that it allowed them, or that, that they allowed it to hinder their relationship with God. And sometimes we do that. Bad things happen and this is one of Satan's tricks. We've talked about it before. Mark chapter 4, he sends trouble your way or people against you with the goal of causing you to be offended with God. You're mad at God, and, and, and God didn't do it. And, and that's not how these people live. They understood, and they went through some stuff. They understood that if it's evil, it comes from the devil. If it's good, it comes from God. 
They understood that God has something for them that's even way better than anything they can have on this planet and that that was the real prize. Thank God for healing your body. Thank God for getting you out of debt. Thank God for that dream house or that dream car or even that dream man or that dream woman. Those are all wonderful blessings, pieces of heaven on earth, but none of that's the real prize. He is the prize. Don't get it twisted. Eternity with him is the prize. Making it to this place, walking in, celebrating, that's the prize because, and I'm really getting into my next series, but I'll just say this, that this life is really like this short. Even if you live 120 years, it's just a little blip compared to eternity. So you got to look at it like that. You know, you can't get so caught up. You know, sometimes with my kids, you know, uh, they've all gone through phases where they just can't stand school. And they're all good students. So it's not like, you know, it's because they're having a hard time. They just don't like it. But they don't get depressed because they, they believe they're going to be in school forever. They know it's for a season. And I tell them, you do the best you can right now. You, you take advantage of this time because it's preparing you for life after school. This, this life is just a season. You're, 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 you're just in school right now. It's called faith school. You're just an athlete who's going through training camp. It might be a little tough right now, but it's going to pay off in the long run. And you got to think like that. We need to live our lives with our eyes focused on heaven. That's why the Bible talks about heaven so much, because it shouldn't be a, a passing thought for you. It should be something that you keep in front of your eyes. Would heaven be pleased by this? Will I be rewarded in heaven for this? Is, is, is my loved one going to heaven with me? That's how we should be thinking. That's how they thought. In fact, Paul said it this way in Philippians chapter 3, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press. That means I'm pursuing, I'm chasing toward the goal, get this, for the upward call of God in Christ. What's the upward call? It's what happened to John. God looks down and says, come up here. So I'm living my whole life to hear that call. I'm living my whole life to stand before God and God to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm living my life with heaven on my mind. God has the ages to come on his mind for you. And really, so should we. So should we. We need to get excited about heaven. And we need to talk about heaven. We need to think about heaven. Live our lives with heaven on our mind. We ought to, we ought to uh, uh, sing about heaven. Because heaven is awesome. And God created it just for you. No more pain. We're thinking, God, we're a pain-free church now. We're thanking God for the healing miracles that have already happened in this series, and I shared some of them, and I know there are more. But you know what? <laughs> There's another place that's so much better. It's called heaven. We, don't, we won't cry. We won't be upset. We won't grieve. We won't be in pain. We won't be talking about COVID-19, the flu, how, you know, I, I, when I was 25, I could do this, but now that I'm 45, I can't barely get out of bed. And I used to be able to see good, but now I need my glasses, and my glasses need glasses. And come on now. We won't be talking about none of that stuff. We're just going to enjoy life with him and with each other. So now every head body of closed in prayer. There may be someone in here that has never chosen to follow Jesus, and I want to challenge you to make sure you see your loved ones that did follow him again. Don't leave this place without making sure that heaven is your home. The Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. How did he give him? He was beaten. He was nailed to a cross. A crown of thorns was put on his head. He died and went to hell for three days. God let him go through all of that. Then he had him rise again. He said, all you would have to do to become a citizen of heaven, a child of God, 
was believe in him. Choose to follow him. And if you've never done that, I want to help you today to make the greatest decision you will ever make. Or you might be someone that says, you know what, I made that decision once upon a time, but I've gotten away from God. I'm not as close to God as I used to be. God still loves you. And he wants you to come home. You were created to be with him, as close to him as possible. And yes, some things may have happened. Maybe you blame God. Maybe you blame church. It doesn't matter. Maybe you blame yourself. It doesn't matter. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, which is written to believers, if we confess of our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The world says, clean yourself up, and then you can come to God. God says, no, come to me, I'll clean you up. He'll forgive you, he'll cleanse you, he'll get you right back on track. We want to help you today with that as well. And so I've given two very simple invitations. The first, to choose to believe in Jesus, to make heaven your home. The second, to get right with him or come home to God. If either one of those invitations apply to you today, if you want to say yes to God concerning either one of those areas, I want to encourage you to just lift your hand up in the air. Go ahead, lift your hand. Even if you're online somewhere, lift your hand because it's really about God seeing it, not me. I see that hand. I see that hand as well. You ready to say, yeah, I want to make sure heaven is my home. I'm, I'm going to switch citizenships. Lift your hand and don't say, well, you know, I'll do it one day or I'm not ready yet. In this crazy world, you may not get home. People die all the time. Particularly if you don't have God's protection. So God has given you this moment in your life. He has set it up for you to make this decision. You don't get to say, well, let me try this. I want to do this a little bit more. Do that a little bit more. There is no sin on this planet worth five seconds of hell. Nothing worth it. And there's no, no, no pleasure on this planet that can compare to the pleasures of heaven. This is an easy choice. Lift your hand and say, yeah, I'm ready. Watch what God does in your life. And of course, I see some hands. Well, if you raised your hand or you know that you should have raised your hand, I want to ask you to do something else. I want you to pray this prayer with me from your heart. Watch what God does in your life. In fact, I'm going to ask everybody in the room to pray it with you as well. And those online, repeat after me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you today to give you my life. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I confess with my mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. I repent of sin. I'm sorry, Lord. I turn away from it and I receive you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer, for answering my prayer, and for saving me now. And Father, we thank you for those that have prayed this prayer for the first time and for those who have chosen to come home to you that because of their decision, they are a part of your family, citizens of your kingdom. We ask that your power work in their lives, helping them to win in whatever situations that they're facing. We pray that you help them to know you, to find freedom through relationship with their, their brothers and sisters, to discover their purpose and to make a mark in this world. We give you the praise and glory for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give a round of applause to those that made that decision. Welcome to the family. Welcome to God's Holy Ghost game.